Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. It, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, and I am your host. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to our show. As I said, my name is W.J. Sheehan, author of the series Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. Nine volumes available in ebook and paperback at Amazon. And da 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 da! Volume nine is finally up and going on Audible. So there's volumes one through nine. Available at Audible and uh, also at iTunes and Amazon as well. So I'm really excited about that. And please go out there and grab a copy for yourself. And now, without any further ado, may I introduce you to my brother and co-host, KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you? I'm doing all right, Bill. I was out in Denver this week. Didn't see any hairy man. Didn't go to a haunted hotel. But uh, flew in at around midnight last night, so I'm happy to be back. (laughs) No hairy man in the parking garage? No hairy man in the parking garage. (laughs) Boy, that's disappointing, I thought for sure. A couple of creatures on the plane. (laughs) A couple of stanky ones? Yeah, there was one guy that got on the plane and... I mean, you only see this in Colorado, I think, folks. He had a boom box he was carrying. This is like a young college kid. All right. A boom box. I haven't seen a boom box in 100 years. And then he had a um, set of headphones on, wired, plugged into the boom box that he's carrying. And remember those long rectangular cases that you could carry like 25 cassette tapes in? Uh, yeah, some, somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you usually you used to have them in your car, you know, back in the cassette days to store your cassettes. Well, he had one of those hanging around his neck. I was nice. like, wow, this is like the kid that time forgot, you know. Yeah, yeah. How about, <laughs> how about the eight-track cases? Yeah, but I'm thinking like, I don't, you know, can you walk through security with a boombox? <laughs> uh, apparently you can. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, it's just a boom box. There's a little plastique in it, but we're going to overlook that. <laughs> I was like, all right. Boy, Check yeah, this boy. out. Check that guy's shoes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, but it's good Good to be back. And uh, we're supposed to get a little bit of snow here today, maybe in North Carolina. Yeah, believe it or not, there was some flurries coming down in Nassau County. Ah, oh, okay. It was just like one of those little patches floating over that area, you know. There was some snow off the shore in the Atlantic, uh, but it uh, the majority of what was there didn't come close to us, you know. Right, right. And I, they're not expecting any accumulation here, but it would be fun to see some flurries. Yeah, you could keep your flurries. When I was out in Denver, <laughs> man, I didn't have to go out in it. It was good. The one morning, all my meetings were at this big hotel there near the airport, and the one morning I got up and I was walk, going for a walk uh, inside this convention center. And uh, it's it was snowing like a blizzard outside. It was super cool. Wow. Yeah. yeah you know, it's nice to look at, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, some of the listeners to our podcast, a lot of the listeners to our podcast, live up there, uh, Oregon, Pacific Northwest, Washington. I got the shout out to... Uh, My buddy Jonathan over there. Uh, These guys are in the thick of it, man. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, my God. Temperatures, snow, wind, rain, sleet. I mean, come on. Yeah, they've been getting some weird weather out west for sure. Yeah, I wonder what the hairy man does in these conditions. They just probably just stomp around. 
Stomp around doing snow angels, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, look at this snow angel, man. That's freaking enormous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, folks, if you have any pictures of giant hairy man snow angels, send those in. Yeah. <laughs> You have to get Andre the Giant to lay down and do it for you. <laughs> oh, my God. Awesome. So, what do we got today, Kevin? Our cryptids in the news and other oddities segment. Yeah, Bill. One of our listeners wrote in about this uh, a few weeks ago, and I hadn't heard about it. And I started looking into it, and I was like, this is a really cool story. So, uh, we're going to talk about the Mantell UFO incident. Okay. And, you know, I, this, this is a great story and I hadn't, like, it kind of rings the bell, but it wasn't uh, super familiar when I went back to it. So this happened back in 1948 on January 7th in Kentucky, in Mm -hmm. uh, Franklin, Kentucky, which is near Fort Knox, Mm -hmm. the infamous Fort Knox. And uh, of course it is a UFO story, or today we would call it a UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, Um, but uh, it's very well documented, and uh, it involves the military as well, so it's super cool. Uh Uh-huh. So this is the one where um, a a 25-year-old captain in the Kentucky Air National Guard, his name was Thomas F. Mantell, he crashed a P-51 Mustang and died in the crash in pursuit of a UFO. Boy, that must have been some dogfight, boy. Well, that's that's it. So um, it's pretty interesting. Now, I mentioned it uh, when we were talking about this, this email that our listeners sent in, that this was one of the sightings, UFO sightings, that was investigated by that organization, secret organization, not so secret anymore, of the United States Air Force called Project Blue Book. Yes, yes. Kind of like the X-Files. Yeah, yeah. They would investigate this stuff. And their conclusion was that he may have died chasing a Skyhook balloon. (laughs) Come on. I know. Well, at least they didn't say he was chasing a bear. Yeah, well, you know, it'd be really difficult for a P-51 to catch a balloon, wouldn't it? (laughs) Come on, people. But but the Skyhook balloons, just, uh, I had to look that up to see what that is. But when you see a picture of a Skyhook balloon, you've seen them before. Yeah. They're um, kind of this helium-filled, silvery, white balloon with the long kind of... uh, uh, plastic material draped over the balloon and then hanging below, long, you know, deep below with whatever cargo it's carrying, like weather equipment and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm at full throttle. I can't catch it. The balloon's <laughs> escaping me. <laughs> that's freaking absolute insanity. Yeah. Skyhook yeah. balloon. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So. So in uh, in this situation, you know the it, it, what's really interesting about this sighting is back then after World War II, you had a lot of these sightings, right, and stuff like that. A lot of it had to do with science fiction, to you know the TV shows, radio shows, all that stuff. Everyone being aware of it, people being worried about you know war and enemies and uh, um, nuclear bombs and stuff like that. Um, but this one, so a lot of that stuff was just written off immediately as being uh, just the public, you know, panicking. But in this case, you know, here a military pilot gets killed in broad daylight chasing this balloon. Um, so it it kind of brought a new sense of seriousness and uh, a big shift in public and government opinion around UFOs at yeah. this point. So yeah, it's a, it's a really important sighting. Yeah, right? no, it definitely is. And uh, I, I just want to give another shout out. Phillips, Phillips' father was a P fifty one pilot in Canada, mm. and uh, he sent me pictures of uh, you know a line of P fifty ones on the runway. Uh, boy, those were magnificent warbirds. Boy, oh, that's spectacular! I have one hanging over my head here at my desk that I built. Is it loaded? It's going, yeah. It's got the invasion stripes on it from D-Day. Nice. 
gear what up. I think it's doing about 400 knots. <laughs> <laughs> the one over my head is called the Berlin Express. Great. Good yeah. name. Good name. Yeah, I love that. So, so <laughs> this uh, this UFO, right? So there's there's folks over at uh, Godman Army Airfield at Fort Knox, Kentucky. They get a report about an unusual aerial object near Madisonville, mm-hmm. and it's they're told that it is a circular object, two hundred and fifty to three hundred feet in diameter, and this is at about one forty five in the day, you know. So right mm-hmm. after lunch. This guy named Sergeant Quinton Blackwell saw an object from his position in the control tower at Fort Knox. A huh. couple other witnesses that weren't in the tower saw this thing, and they said it was very white and about one-fourth the size of the full moon. Wow. Yeah. And they said through binoculars, it appeared to have a red border at the bottom. Hmm. And it remained stationary, Bill, for what seemed like one and a half hours. Boy, it really sounds like a balloon to me. Yeah. Well, get this. It gets better. (laughs) Observers at Clinton County Army Airfield in Ohio, so, you know, up the road a bit, they're seeing it too, and they describe the object as having the appearance of a flaming red cone trailing a gaseous green mist. Yeah. And they saw it for about 35 minutes. So you see a lot of balloon spill with flames coming out the back, right? I, I was just going to say, that just sealed it for me. <laughs> so wh- so what's next in cryptids in the news? I think we've gotten right to the bottom of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these uh, four P-51Ds, uh, Mustangs, are out flying. They're in the air already from the uh, 165th Fighter Squadron of the Kentucky Air National Guard. One of them is piloted by this Captain Thomas F. Mantell. Uh, they're in the air, and they're told to approach the object. They're in uh, radio communication with the pilots throughout the event, of course. One of the pilots' Mustangs was low on fuel, so he turned around and came back to base, or, or at least that's the story he told. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but he was low on fuel and yeah. went back. Uh-huh. And... Um, um, Mantel uh, went after this thing in a steep climb, you know, basically wide open, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he couldn't seem to catch it. And he got up to about 25,000 feet with his wingman, and his wingman's telling him, hey, you got to pull off of this because they didn't have oxygen, apparently. And um, um, his wingman pulls off, and apparently Mantel blacks out, they think at around 25,000 feet or higher. And they saw his plane kind of spiraling slowly back down toward the ground in, in like a, a, you know, a circle getting mm-hmm. lower and lower. Mm-hmm. And his plane eventually crashed just south of Franklin, Kentucky in a, in a field. Wow. It yeah. really does sound like he did, in fact, black out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I got to correct myself, too, because I said before Philip's father, it was Jonathan's father. Uh, who was the P-51 pilot. Okay. I realized I missed spoke. Well, that's pretty good. (laughs) So this was reported, you know, across the U.S. in the newspapers back then, right? This pilot killed, captain, Air National Guard, chasing what he thinks is a UFO. Of course, I'm sure in the articles then they didn't say it was a weather balloon because that was a blue book. Project Blue Book finding, and there was no such thing right. back then, of course. Uh, but it's interesting, when this was reported around the nation, not only what I said, which I think is close to what really happened, um, there were all kinds of rumors and claims that, like, the flying saucer was, in fact, a Soviet missile. Um, it was an alien spacecraft that actually shot down the P-51 Mustang. Mm-hmm. And then it was told that, uh, you know, one of the rumors was that Captain Mantell's body, you know, was uh, found uh, full of bullet holes. You know, so kind of like he was shot down by this thing. And uh, other stories said that he was radioactive and the wreckage of his plane was highly radioactive. But, you know, we'll never really know. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, all most balloons, 
uh, to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if you think otherwise, Kev, yeah. most balloons uh, do have several 30 caliber machine guns mounted on them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're laughing. That's true. Yeah, yeah, I know that's true. Not sure about that. <laughs> I know you're an expert in balloons. <laughs> Party balloons. Especially armed balloons. Armed balloons and uh, party hats and uh, plastic flutes. That's my, <laughs> that's my field of expertise. <laughs> Kazoos, party hats, and balloons. But, yeah, and so, so this incident um, was one, you know, it's described as one of three classic UFO cases in that year. Uh, that would help define UFO phenomenon in, in the public mind. And I'm just going to touch on these other two because I haven't covered them yet either. Uh-huh. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on them as a little bit of a teaser, but I think I will do episodes on them in the future. Okay. So one is the Child's Whited UFO encounter. And this occurred in the early morning at about 2.45 in the morning on July 24th, 1948, near Montgomery, Alabama. So this is pretty interesting, Bill. This was two commercial airline pilots flying a plane, and they observed a glowing object coming right at them, and then it passed right by their plane. Yeah. And then disappeared. Yeah, this has happened more often than people will ever know, where pilots feel a crash is imminent. Yep. They can't evade it, and this thing is going to hit us. Yep. Yep. Uh, what that's all about is anybody's guess, but it's obviously under some type of control that it could strafe so close and not make impact. Right. You know, it's a deliberate act, you know. Yep. And then there's another another uh, um, incident that occurred right around the same period um, where it's called the Gorman dogfight. And it also happened with uh, the United States Air Force near Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. And uh, they were chasing uh, chasing what they thought was a UFO. Nobody died in that one that we know of. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there's a lot of this that goes on. And definitely, uh, we'll talk about it, Kev. You know, you yeah. do your due diligence and we'll, yeah. we'll pull them up. But all of that stuff is grist for the mill. Because uh, there's a lot of strange shenanigans going out on out there in the sky. And uh, it's not weather balloons, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you that the sightings that I've had were not weather balloons. Right. right. So, no, that, that, so that's the Mantel uh, incident. And, and uh, I forget who wrote in and told me about that. But thank you so much because... One, it's super fascinating to to read about it and learn about it, and great to share it with our audience as well. So keep the ideas coming in. Like when you write in at uh, uh, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com, contact us. I love to hear feedback on uh, on what we're doing, of course, but I also love to hear ideas, new ideas. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And, and folks, if you're new to the podcast, uh, this is an interactive podcast. Uh, we're always reaching out. We have many, many listeners uh, who contact us at BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the contact button. And uh, we're always getting, I am working on a fantastic uh, multi-decade uh, Bigfoot account that will be in volume 10 when that, whenever that is done. But there's always new information coming forward. Uh, by you, our listeners. So uh, spend the time, take the time to be a contributor. Uh, we're glad for our listeners, right, Kev? Absolutely, yeah. But but to contribute uh, goes a couple of tiers above listening. If you've seen something, say something. And that's the bottom line. So that was really interesting, Kev, the Mantell UFO uh Incident. Incident. Oh, right. Franklin, Kentucky. Wow. And here, and you were talking in the other ones in uh, one of the Dakotas. Yep. Fargo. Fargo, Dakota. And what was the other state? Arkansas? Um, no, Alabama. Alabama. So, 
Birmingham, you know, Alabama. Yeah, so there's stuff going on all over the place. You yeah, know, no doubt about it. This phenomena is not limited to uh, certain areas of the country by any means. Very, very interesting. Well, I have something uh, pretty cool here. Uh, I'm digging into the archives a little bit. I always bring stuff forward periodically because not only am I interested again and again in this subject matter, but we always have new people coming into the podcast that haven't heard any of these before, any of these accounts. And frankly, not everybody goes back to episode one and listens to everything coming forward. <laughs> and by the way, Bill, thank goodness. <laughs> We've improved a bit since episode one. <laughs> well, Kev, I've always been excellent. Oh, yeah. And that's just my opinion. Of course. <laughs> Pardon me while I slick my hair back and fix my tie. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Bella Lugosi? Every time he appeared, you know, that funny little bat with strings attached to it would show up in <laughs> a <the> window. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, he would be standing in the, the living room of this castle, you know, with his slick cape on and his black hair with Vitalis all slicked back, you know. Good oh, evening. Yeah. <laughs> and it, <laughs> how do I get on this stuff? Anyways, uh. This sighting was brought to my attention by Lee Rutherford, a lifelong resident of the state of West Virginia. This is what Lee saw while on the hunt for rabbit in November of 1965. As you already know, Bill, I turned 88 this past June. And when I ran across your query for those of us who have seen a Bigfoot in our lifetime, I thought I would share with you and your readers just what I had experienced in November of 1965. Keep in mind that at that time I had no knowledge of what was said to have been discovered in the Pacific Northwest. But we had more than enough local lore about the hairy man and the booger that went back for generations in our own neck of the woods. The cold nights of October, coupled with the morning's frost, had me itching for the arrival of opening day for rabbit season, which in all parts began in November. There was a tremendous amount of land, both federally owned and state owned, available for the hunt. And at that time, a large amount of farming properties had already been abandoned and were being reclaimed by Mother Nature in the form of brush and briar fields, which made for spectacular rabbit hunting. I personally knew of, at the time, an old codger named Mr. Graves, whose family had owned a number of large land holdings in the region. And he would allow me to hunt his properties in exchange for some field game. And so it was that November had finally rolled around and I took my beagle ruffian out for the first hunt of the new season. I was working a 600-acre field that was once used for growing cotton which was now comprised of waist-deep bramble and some thin trees. Mr. Graves would take out his tractor with a cutting attachment on it prior to the season opener and carve out a number of pathways around the field in order to aid in the hunt. (coughs) Excuse me. On my first day in, Ruffian and I had scored seven nice cottontails in four hours, and I made my way back home. The following day, we had a heavy rain, and it was two days later that I was back in the field on the hunt. Now, the area which I had gone into on this day was a low-lying field. I mention this because the land from my position elevated some 50 feet or so going to my north at about 300 yards, 
which concealed the rest of the field from my view, unless, of course, I was to walk up this elevation. So Ruffian was working the brush hard, and as of 8 a.m., I hadn't yet fired a round. It was windy and very cold. At this point, I was walking, cradling my Remington in my arms, heading in a westerly direction on one of the paths that Mr. Graves had cut through the bramble. The elevation which I just described to you was on my right-hand side, being to the north. Suddenly, Ruffian let, let out one of his beagle howls, and I turned my head to the north in response. When to my utter amazement, Standing directly atop of this somewhat ridge, some 300 yards away from me, was a huge hairy man staring in my direction. Ruffian was leaping up and down howling as the beast just stood there unmoving. Now the growth on this field was uniformly about three to four feet tall. And at the distance I saw the creature standing, the brush was concealing its lower body to about mid-thigh. The creature just stood its ground for maybe a minute as I attempted to calm Ruffian in the hope of not scaring it off before I had some more time to look it over. But such was not the case that day, for no sooner had I calmed Ruffian down than did the beast turn and walk back out of sight behind this ridge. This beast was standing against a backdrop of a gray and white sky, also amidst a gray and golden yellow field of bramble and tall grass. Its outline was almost black, and it had to have been standing some 10 feet tall. I could see, even at the distance I was away from it, that its upper shoulders tapered up to what was the sides of its head. It appeared to be broad and muscular, with its chest being in a very distinct, somewhat V-shape, and its arms hanging away from its sides. On the following day, having told Mr. Graves about what I had seen, we took the tractor back into the field and drove it through the bramble to the place where I had seen this hairy man. We could see the trail that it had made parting the bramble coming into the field from the wood line to the north. We followed the trail on the tractor, and along the way we came across a large pile of scat which was definitely not that of any animals in the area. It was comprised of large, long pieces that looked similar to that of a human, only longer and wider in diameter. I realize that nobody is too keen on talking about scat, but as a hunter, scat is an important determining factor when tracking. Our morning ended with nothing else having been found. What do you think of that, Kev? Pretty wild. Now, that was Virginia, Bill? West Virginia. West Virginia, okay. The rabbit hunter. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty pretty wild. I like yeah. the name of his beagle, too. Yeah, Ruffian. Kind of cool, huh? <laughs> Ruffian's a great name for a beagle. <laughs> but, you know... Here you go again, you know, uh, just a person going about their day, probably when most people are sleeping. He's out with the dog trying to score a couple of rabbits in the brush. And uh, lo and behold, he's confronted with this hairy man. Yep. Interesting, too, how he had mentioned that irregardless of uh, what had been said uh uh, later than this particular event he had about Bigfoot, they had tradition in their neck of the woods going back hundreds of years. 
Right. You know, oral tradition or uh, oral lore, if you will, being passed forward. Uh, and it's interesting because it reminds me of uh, conversations I have had with Philip uh, in Kentucky, uh, where they have known about the hairy man down there generationally for a long, long time. Uh, and it wasn't called Bigfoot. It was called the, the wild man or the hairy man. Or the hairy man or the booger. Or the booger. Yeah. I you mean, know. It, it's, um, you know, the name Bigfoot is pretty modern, right? You know, back to that account in uh, California. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but people have been seeing it forever. And Sasquatch, we don't know how old that name is, right? Because it's uh, adopted basically from the indigenous people's word, right? As I understand it. Yeah, and, you know, I had asked Philip at one time, he's very knowledgeable of things down in that area, uh, I had asked him uh, where the term booger had originated from, and uh, he said that the term booger was originally a Germanic word, which basically meant some type of, like, demon, yeah. s- some dark entity. Uh, I forget what the word was, but it wasn't booger. And, of course, the word became bastardized in, in the United States right? Uh, by people coming forward to the term we now use, you know, with booger, you know. But uh, so people have had knowledge of these things and sightings and uh, were warned of them uh, by their elders uh, going back hundreds of years. Hmm. And here we have... Uh, Lee Rutherford going out for a morning hunt and this thing just appears to him looks stands there, turns and walks away Yeah, Uh, just an observation you know, by both parties Yeah, I guess he's lucky that broad broad daylight, plain sight sees the whole thing you know, not one of these things where you're peeking through branches and you see a, a a face or something like that, you know. Well, you know, a lot of people, we see all of these Bigfoot shows, right? They're always out with night vision, right. this and that. But a huge amount of sightings occur yeah. in broad daylight. Yeah. I, I mean, so to me, I'm like, why not walk around in the daytime when you can see everything that's going on around you? Oh, you mean compared to the Bigfoot shows where they're always out at night? I agree with you. Yeah. I, I mean... I think in Washington State, there's reported to be like uh, over 30,000 bears. Uh, I, I guess the DEC or somebody comes up with these figures, but that's... They have a, a census. They send out a little thing to the bears when they're waking up from hibernation. Right. Just fill out the little form. Yeah. You know. how, how many bears live in your household? Drop it. Drop it in a ranger station. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your ethnicity? Try not to hurt the ranger when you drop it off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how many cars are in your den? <laughs> <laughs> how many youngins do you have? How many youngins do you have? Uh, are there any human remains in your fireplace? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Is there a human on your <laughs> fireplace spigot? As you fill out this form. <laughs> no, things like that. People are interested in such things. Unbelievable. Awesome. Well, before we get too far off the tracks, Kev, yeah. uh, what do we have in our listener mail today? Ah, uh, yes. We have some good uh, emails that came in, Bill, and some folks have been following the advice of sharing uh other uh, creatures and sightings uh, with us. So it's, the first one is Joe from Nyack, New York, Ooh. up the river from you, Bill. Yeah, up uh, what river? <laughs> the Hudson. <laughs> the, oh, these, yeah, the river in my backyard. Yeah, yeah, that river. Yeah, the subject is the Kinderhook creature. Whoa. But Joe talks about some other stuff, too. He says, hi, you guys, it's Joe. Just wanted to pass this article on to you both with KJ more in mind, as I thought this might be a good subject for your cryptids in the news segment. Uh-huh. 
Seems like upstate New York has its share of high strangeness and spooky creatures. <laughs> also included a great list of places in New York where you might see a UFO as well. Wow. So we appreciate that. I got I got the link, and uh, I'm going to look into some of this stuff, Joe. And then Joe goes on uh, further and says, W.J., I'm the fourth grade teacher in Nyack you spoke to a while back. Mm-hmm. Sorry for ne- never following up, having you Zoom with kids for a talk about writing. Things were crazy with COVID and kids going remote, and I just lost, tr- lost track. If it's okay with you, I'd love to see if we might be able to put something together in the near future for the kids to learn about the craft of writing and storytelling from you. I hope it can work out. And Joe, you must be a brave man inviting my brother to meet with a class of fourth graders. <laughs> Joe, I, it'll be a day they never forget. I hope you have a, <laughs> you're a tenured teacher. <laughs> you can't be fired for this decision. <laughs> Joe goes on to say, love the show. My wife and I never miss an episode and find ourselves quoting you guys and re-listening to the show's <laughs> All the time. <laughs> we think you're both great. All the best on a happy and healthy new year. Yeah. Can't wait to hear the new episode. <laughs> hey, Mr. Right. Hey, Mr. Joe, that guy was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, Joe, for writing in, and thanks for suggesting the uh, idea as well. Yeah, well, uh, you know... Uh, it really does. It warms my heart, Kev, when I hear from these school teachers uh, that are uh, reading uh, accounts to the kids, <laughs> and it, it sparks their interest because they're they're burdened down with a lot of data that they're not too interested in. And uh, when you throw them a curveball, and they're like, "What?" The? You know, yeah, it keeps their attention going, if nothing else. Absolutely. And maybe I've had a couple of teachers tell me that it sparked their interest in reading. Oh, yeah. Anything that can get you going reading is a good thing. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. So, you know, you do the planning, you contact me, and uh, we'll make that happen. It would be a lot of fun. I'd love to see the kids on Zoom and answer any questions they have and perhaps uh, scare the bejesus out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, you know, in the meantime, don't tell my brother I told you. You might want to check your employment agreement and uh, maybe instill some type of uh, seven-second delay in the Zoom so you could, like, bleep stuff out before the kids actually hear it. <laughs> hey, Kev, I'm thinking maybe I could wear some kind of cool Krampus head. Oh, definitely. While I'm doing the Zoom meeting. Some blood dripping from the Krampus horns. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) Kev. Do you remember the Monsters episode where Eddie won the I Like Zombo Because contest? (laughs) Yes, yes. And when he gets to the studio, he's completely disappointed because Zombo had no makeup on. No, I know, and they're thinking of him, like, oh, you got all dressed up for us. What are you talking about? (laughs) He was a fake. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God, Zombo. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, man. So uh, next uh, email comes in from David. David doesn't say where he is, um, but he says, I just listened to your podcast, 181, the West Virginia Bigfoot with the Moonshine. Uh-huh. It reminded me of a song recorded by Jimmy Buffett called God's Own Drunk. Fire <laughs> <laughs> boy. In this, he's, he, Jimmy's, the, the, the lyrics go that this guy is watching his brother still in the mountains. And after some consumption of moonshine, he's confronted by a bear who ends up taking the still in the en- taking the still from him. And in the end, there's a lot of humorous lines in the song. I guess you could switch bear with a Sasquatch and have it line up with your story. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah. Talking about somebody who went off the rails, God's I own heard drunk that Buffett song, but I gotta I gotta go check it out. <laughs> Yeah, let me know if you like it or not. 
(laughs) (laughs) All right. And our last email this week, Bill, comes in from Kate. And Kate is from... Gilbert, Arizona, and I used to live, uh, oh, I'm sorry, she's from Gilbert, Arizona, but she lives in San Jose today. I was going to say, I used to live close to Gilbert, Arizona, out in the desert. Um, So she writes in, hello, Bill and Kevin. My name is Kate. I'm from San Jose, California, but originally, uh, uh, I I mixed it all up, Bill. Go ahead. That's all right. My name is Kate, and I'm from San Jose, Originally, but currently living in Gilbert, Arizona. There you go. A reversal. Right. A reversal. A yeah, reversal. <laughs> I love your podcast, and I'm a big believer in all high strangeness, as Bill would say. Look, mm-hmm. Bill, you got a lot of people quoting you. <laughs> I'm a bit behind on episodes, but I have listened from the beginning. I just heard your Halloween episode and Bill's story of the two cats. Mm. I feel there there is a strange quiet and loneliness when someone we love passes, but there are signs that they remain. I was born at 2.22 a.m. Just recently was the 15-year anniversary of my mom's passing. I, I miss seeing her every day, and ever since her passing, I see two colon 2-2 everywhere, so like the time of day of 2-22. Okay. I used to work as a pastry chef and would set a timer, but would look up at exactly 2 minutes and 22 seconds remaining on the timer. Huh. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night exactly at 2 a.m. and 22 minutes, or look at the clock in the middle of the afternoon, again, 2-22. Huh. I can't help but think that my mom is around and just letting me know. Mm -hmm. It gives me great comfort, and I hope Paula's cats do the same for you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I very much enjoy your podcast and laugh often to you both. Thanks so much for what you do, Kate from Gilbert, Arizona. So, Kate, you know, first off, I got to tell you, are you sure your clock is working? (laughs) Because <laughs> sometimes when you buy those clocks, Bill, they have that sticker over the display that says like 222. Well, you know just what, to show you what the display looks like. You know what they say? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Twice a day. No, I'm just I'm just kidding, Kate. Of course, it's a it's a cool story, and um, and uh, I think there definitely are signs, like Bill mentioned when he was talking about the gatos. Yeah, now I, I got to share with the listeners a couple of things that have happened uh, more recently, and you might say coincidence. I, I have no answer for these things. All I know is they haven't happened before, so that's my bar. This is not something that regularly happens. In fact, really, nothing has happened uh, in regards to these types of things uh, uh, before uh, Paul uh, passed to heaven. I have a bird clock on the wall in my living room. Many of you know what that is. On the hour, there's a variety of birds at the hourly position on the clock, and when the hand hits it, you hear the birds call. So a couple of weeks ago, I was standing in the living room right next to this clock, and uh, it really doesn't matter what time it was. I think it was... uh, the time when, let's just say, the nuthatch would make its little call. And all of a sudden, the loon starts going off. Loon, L-O-O-N, which is one of the loudest calls on the clock. Also, one of the coolest sounds. I mean, Bill, you know we go camping up in New Hampshire a lot. Yeah. it is the coolest sound in the morning when you hear that loon out on the lake when you're when you're just waking up. It's like, yeah, and it's very <laughs> loud on this bird clock. Well, they are loud in real life too. Cool sure. Bird. And so I'm standing next to the clock, and I turn my head because uh, it, it hit me. It hit me, and I was like, "Wait a second! That's supposed to be the nut nut hatch." And not only that, the loon comes up at like the 6 o'clock position, and this was like, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So that was really weird. Could that happen? I guess so. But I have never heard the clock do that before or since, not once. The other interesting thing that had occurred was I 
came home from work one night, and Kev, I had one of the F1 races uh, DVR'd. Right. And I sat down to pull up the race at about, you know, midnight. Yep. And I'm watching it, and you know how they have all of the driver's ratings and their placements on that bar coming down the left side of the screen. Yep. So mine was shifted off to the side, and I couldn't see it. And I was like, ah, come on. What are they doing now? They lost up the whole picture. And for whatever reason, I decided to go into the settings on my remote. And lo and behold, in the settings, which is a multiple, uh, a multi-step process to get to where you can change the screen, the screen was set on stretch. Hmm. Now, I always leave it on normal because you got normal stretch and zoom. Right. And it was set on stretch. Now, I didn't do it. Do you think that can just happen? It just goes from normal to stretch with nobody having handled the remote? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, anything's possible with TVs, but Ex- I get where you I Exactly. Where it's just, it's like the clock. Yeah. The loon goes off. I've never had this happen before. What the heck? You know, and it's just interesting that little oddities uh, occur, you know, and they make you. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, the loon clock, that's that's a little weirder to me than the TV setting. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, you have to look at everything in its totality and say, well, that's a little weird. Yeah. You know, and it's all a little weird. And uh, I always, like, thank her. Or, you know, of course, I love her dearly. And uh, uh, it's just it's just remarkable, you know. But the two cats, the two cats, unbelievable. <laughs> yep, yep. Very cool. So is that well, it for today, Ken? That's it for today, Bill. And folks out there, thank you for listening. Uh, do me a favor. Tell some of your friends about the podcast. Even if you don't know if they're Bigfoot fans, uh, they will probably like us, and we'd love to continue to grow our uh, subscriptions. And, you know, you're doing a great job giving us those five-star reviews, which certainly helps, but tell a couple of your friends, too. Yeah, no, that's a great idea, Kev. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are based on the uh, oh yeah feedback we're getting and... Uh, I'm going to be doing a, <coughs> an interview, I told you, with uh, Richard Serrett, uh, one of the uh, hosts from uh, Coast to Coast AM, uh, at the end of the month. So when that happens, um, I'll let you guys know when I've done it, and you can pull it up on Richard's uh, podcast. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Richard's a really good guy, and I told him he's one of my favorite hosts uh, on the show, and it just uh, came out of the blue. He contacted me and said, I'd love to have you as a guest on my podcast, so of course I'm going to do it. Cool. <laughs> so we'll see. But anyways, cool. folks, if you should find yourself walking your dog or going for a walk with your husband in the fields of West Virginia or anywhere else for that matter. You better remember just one thing. Always carry more gun than you think you're gonna need. Sleep tight.